where you see the passing of time. We crowd in St. Peter's Square are praying like mad for the Pope's life. Where moments refuse to die. This is a momentous hour in world history. This is the invasion of Hitler's Europe. And where victory lives on. Plenty of girls are being kissed by plenty of boys they don't know and they do not care. You can love it, hate it, embrace it, or turn away. Lennon was shot to death late last night outside his apartment building. But it is a past we all share. Come on out here and give me a salute. Big baby salute. This is where yesterday has a home, where we wonder what it was like back then. Go forward, knights in safety. And not too long ago. His spirit must live on. It's where history has its place and where the past comes alive. The History Channel. Hello, I'm Roger Mudd. Welcome to the History Channel. In the 1930s, a traveling ice cream salesman named Howard Johnson discovered a way to cash in on America's growing love affair with the car. He started a chain of restaurants, each with the bright orange roof that would become so familiar to drivers around the country. Johnson was a believer in uniformity. Every hot dog had to be sliced lengthwise exactly six times. Every cup of coffee had to be filled three-eighths of an inch from the top. But long before Howard Johnson, there were other entrepreneurs who offered food and fuel to drivers, and they were anything but uniform. Our program looks at the restaurants, motels, and gas stations that sprang up across America, wherever asphalt was laid down. They provided drivers with fast food, free road maps, spotless restrooms, and service with a smile. Join us now as the History Channel presents Highway Hangouts, the history of America's roadside attractions. Let's go for a ride. The American Road. It was once like no place else on Earth. It flourished back when Americans were intoxicated with the car, when the car was the perfect three-dimensional expression of American freedom. To anyone with a few hundred bucks it took to buy one, the call of the open road was irresistible. But for some, the real action was on the side of the road. From the turn of the century to the 1960s, whole new categories of roadside businesses grew up, and boy, were they fun. There were diners shaped like coffee pots, where the food was always sublime. Family-owned motels of every shape and size. Gas stations offering cheap fuel, sparkling service, and free marriages. And for the amusement of weary travelers, roadside attractions. Behind each of these were amazing stories of mom-and-pop entrepreneurs with plenty of down-home ingenuity. This was the golden age of roadside America. Let's go for a ride. There was a time in America when travel was just about getting somewhere. In those early days, if you wanted to get anywhere, you needed a lot of time and a strong constitution. Even when the trains came along, they were hardly comfortable. And of course, you went where they went. But then at the turn of the century, a new mode of transportation hit the scene. It would pave the way for a new freedom Americans had never before experienced on the open road. I think the road in the early years of the automobile really signified uh, adventure and freedom. Uh, it, it was a way to uh, get away from your environment, to explore new things, uh, see places that were interesting, uh, vacations, travel, put the family in the car. So it expressed a lot of things that, uh, that people like to do. At first, the car was a novelty, a plaything for the rich. But that was okay. At the time, between cradle and grave, the average American never ventured more than 25 miles from home. It was, of course, Henry Ford who changed everything. 
His dream was to build a good car just about any American could afford. To build it fast and pay the men who built it a good wage and unheard of five dollars a day. The statistics of Model T tell it all. Introduced in 1908, there were four million on the road by 1920. For the first time, not only did you have an inexpensive car with the Model T, but now you had one that was built so that it could traverse all the horrible roads of the country. And uh, if it broke along the way, uh, anything from a screwdriver to a raw egg would help uh, repair it. Ah, happy memory. Just a few twists of the crank and there we are. These early cars were built with high carriages to get you over the muddy, unpaved tracks that constituted most of the roads at the time. It was tough going. Soon, the demand to replace these roads became loud and clear. And in 1916, President Wilson signed the Good Roads Bill, earmarking $85 million for highway construction. Then in 1923, the first real coast-to-coast -coast national road was built, the Lincoln Highway. It was actually a series of roads that already existed, but it marked the beginning of the modern highway. It also marked the first great rush to cash in on a driving public that now had some place to go. At every turn in the road, a gas station or a small restaurant or a campsite sprang up. At the summit of almost every hill, a businessman would offer free water to the overheated car and sell soda and sandwiches to the overheated passengers. Free lookout towers were another draw. These exciting new businesses and innovative business owners became institutions on the American road. Among the very first needs entrepreneurs aimed to fill was for gasoline. In the late 19th century, storekeepers would just sell you a can of gasoline from a big barrel to empty into the tank, but that was dangerous and not very efficient. Then, in the spirit of ingenuity, the gas pump was invented by Sylvanus F. Bowser in 1885. He rigged it up in his barn with a converted water pump and a plunger to force the gasoline to the top. Soon others joined in, and before long there were at least a hundred independent pump producers. In the 1920s, as in modern pumps, the transfer of gas was hidden. But back then, motorists suspected they were being cheated by these newfangled devices. So the visible or gravity pump was introduced. Gas was first pumped into a glass cylinder atop the pump that had measurements marked on it. As the gas was drained through the hose into the car, the wary customer could see he was getting what he paid for. In 1921, there were at least 12,000 gas stations in service, and nearly 150,000 just a decade later. By the 1930s, gas stations were everywhere. A survey found at least one gas station every 900 feet between New York City and New Haven, Connecticut. As competition grew, the oil companies tried to differentiate themselves from each other. But gas was pretty much gas. Still, they did what they could. They would dye gasoline different colors. Texaco was green, Esso was red, Sunoco was blue. But that was just the beginning of an endless series of marketing schemes. With so much competition, it became clear to the oil companies that they needed more than just gas to sell gas. Soon stations offered service with a smile. Attendants rushed up to clean your windshield and check your oil while someone else leaned in your window with a one-word question, fill her up. Drive to where the tall pines grow and the air so fresh and cool. 
drive to where you can sail and fish and bask in the sun. To where you can see famous places, scenes of historic interest. The world is just outside your windshield, and this man helps you enjoy the view. He's your Phillips 66 dealer, famous for hospitality on the highway. Notice your windshield wiper's kind of loose. There, she's okay now. The various companies each fought to show that they cared more about your car than their rivals. According to their ads, you could count not just on a welcome, but a dazzling mile-wide smile from their attendants. In fact, it seemed like filling up was just about the best time you could have in town, at least legally. Even President Truman helped get the point across. Harry S. Truman of Independence, Missouri, stops for gas at Frederick, Maryland, en route to a place called Washington. Like many another American tourist, he says, fill her up to the gas station attendant with whom he has a pleasant chant about his trip into the nation's capital. All said again, the missus gets back in the car, followed by the driver, who was used to driving big jobs. He had a big one in the White House. Now he's just another tourist heading east to familiar scenes in Washington, D.C. And no politics, says Mr. Truman. Have a nice trip, folks. Celebrity endorsements became a staple of oil company ads. Union 76 turned to a great clown of the silent days. And the Union Oil Company unleashed a very young and struggling actress named Marilyn to round up customers. I call her Cynthia. She's going to have the best care a car ever had. Put Royal Triton in Cynthia's little tummy. Right, lady. Cynthia will just love that Royal Triton. Another big way companies tried to win customers was with their non-auto service. A real need, restrooms, became a major selling point. I do remember that in traveling out of town to some of the larger communities and as far down as Boston or New York City, I, I do remember that clean restrooms uh, was a common sign to read on the highway. Earlier, the restrooms weren't just clean, they were fancy. The Ohio Company described one of its bathrooms of the 1920s. The ladies' restroom next to the Lubratorium is a work of art in itself. Several mahogany chairs and a Venetian wall mirror make up the delightful appointments of this room. Right now, white cars like these are making their rounds clean across the country. They're Texaco's new and exclusive service patrol. Later, gas stations anywhere. came up with other bathroom that gimmicks. Means restrooms that are sparkling clean. Texaco's bathrooms, for example, weren't just clean, they were registered and numbered. ...from Texaco dealers clean across the nation. The new Texaco Service Patrol. Shell turned to the chairwoman of the Public Health Division of America's Women's Clubs to endorse their spotless restrooms. Philip 66 sent out actual nurses to inspect its bathrooms. And Union 76 had a sparkle core of white-gloved young ladies searching for dirty restrooms to set right. Another way the individual stations tried to outdo each other was with special gimmicks. During the 1920s and 30s era, it was fairly common to see a captive black bear at a roadside stand or filling station to uh, attract the attention of the traveler, the passerby, and thereby do business with them at the gasoline pump or in the little shop. And one gas station even offered free marriages so you could tie the knot and conveniently fill up at the same time. Taking a trip? Well, before you go, do you know the best roads to travel? The time it'll take, the sights you should see in their history, the smart things to pack for the family. Well, look what's new, just right for you. It's the Fact Phil Pleasure Pack Texaco Touring Atlas. And only Texaco has it. One service that was a real boon to travelers was the free road map. 
A map could carry advertisements for a range of products, and attractive graphics could make it a proud standard bearer for the company. One of the first was issued in 1914 by Gulf Oil, and by 1964, gas companies nationwide had passed out nearly five billion of them. Getting the knack of refolding a map became a new pastime. Different folding methods were designed and patented by the different companies, and each had a name. The accordion fold, the pleat, the side out, and the combo and diagonal fold. This man obviously likes to go first class. Credit was another come on, and if you think the gasoline credit card is a recent innovation, guess again. Credit card. You can use a Phillips 66 credit card to buy gasoline, motor oil, and other great Phillips 66 products. Some companies were issuing handwritten paper cards in the 1920s, personally signed by district sales managers years before wallets filled up with plastic. Credit card is a first class passport to everywhere. Despite the challenges, the stations themselves often became things of beauty and the pride of neighborhoods. What had started out as undistinguished buildings and even eyesores became three-dimensional advertisements for their companies. Some companies went for the unusual and attention grabbing. Others chose tasteful, conservative designs. Eventually, some of America's best designers, like Frank Lloyd Wright, Frederick Frost, Raymond Lowy, were brought in to spiff up both the gas stations and the company's images. On a tour across America 50 years ago, you could have stopped at stations that ranged from neoclassical design to airplanes. In Seattle, you could have filled up under a giant cowboy hat and relieved yourself inside giant boots. The Hat and Boots gas station is one of the most inventive, creative, sensational, unbelievable gas stations that's ever existed in the United States. The hat, which was bright red, was the cover for the office and the boots, they were very large, about 20 feet high, uh, housed the men's and the women's bathrooms. And as pop sculpture and as pop architecture, that's mighty hard to beat. And today, after all that wonderful history, what have we gotten to? The multi-purpose quick stop grocery gas station. Convenient, but not exactly inspiring. That's today. But 70 years back, thanks to Henry Ford and the oil companies, America was on the road and loving it. Now it had to find a place to stay. By 1930, America was off and running, and running. In that year, car-crazy Americans logged more than 150 billion miles. Some 170,000 gas stations serviced over 23 million cars. And a new need, an oasis for all those weary travelers was born. The motel, a home away from home. The demand became so great that between 1935 and 1958, 40,000 motels sprung up, and as you will see, they proved to be among the most ingenious of America's roadside establishments. The motel had its beginnings in the early decades of the 20th century. Then there were two options for travelers. They could stay at a flea bag hotel or boarding house near the railway station, or they could stay at one of the swanky downtown hotels. Either was fine for train travelers, but car travelers had special needs. They were often covered with the soot and grime of the road. The very thought of traipsing through the lobby of a fancy hotel was embarrassing, to say the least. No, America's new auto gypsies, as they were called, needed an alternative. So the road itself soon became America's hotel. In essence, a trip back to nature using 20th century technology. At first, weary travelers would pull over and simply plop down in a farmer's field or schoolyard. By 
1915, the quest was on to restrict all these new auto gypsies to controlled, manageable places. Towns and cities designated free parks to attract tourists and dollars to their fair towns. By 1920, over 300 cities provided free tourist parks. Within three years, that number had jumped to 2,000. Municipalities, especially in the West, built campgrounds to attract tourists. Overland Park in Denver and Elysian Park in Los Angeles held hundreds of tourists and put them up at practically no expense. But the tourists themselves had to set up tents and bring folding equipment. Automobumming, bumming as it was, was traveling around and having a heck of a time and having a hard time at the same time. Sinclair Lewis coined the phrase automobummer bummer to describe this new breed of traveler. The early auto camps really packed them in. Only a car width separated the tents. And there were gimmicks. The People's Oil Company campground even offered a pet alligator to entertain the tourists. But what fun it was. The life of the automobummer bummer was neatly encapsulated by author Kenneth Roberts in 1922. In the morning, I get up and eat one of these individual packages of breakfast food. While I'm doing that, the water is boiling for my coffee. As soon as the coffee is done, I put on my frying pan with eggs in it. I use two paper napkins. When I have finished breakfast, I put the eggshells in the breakfast food box, wipe out the frying pan with the napkins, put them into the box on top of the eggshells, and touch a match to the box. That cleans everything up. These low-budget travelers were best represented by one type in particular. In Florida, they called them tin can tourists. The expression said to derive from the fact that they would put a Campbell soup can over their radiator cap and that they folded everything up to get them in their cars, uh, including their children, which were also said to fold up. By the late 1920s, the unique appeal of the auto camp had begun to wear off. Transients took to moving in for protracted periods of time. The most notorious tin can tourists were known to spend the entire winter at free campgrounds while living on the dole. So, many of the municipal camps were closed down. The better class of traveler began looking for something different, a bit more like a home away from home. Individual cabins, the precursor to the motel, came into being. The early cabins, uh, as much as we went to romanticize them, were really just shacks. Uh, they would have enough room maybe for a, a cot and uh, usually no running water, uh, no heat. And it wasn't until maybe the 30s that people started installing little uh, stoves, uh, beds, and running water. Oftentimes the toilets would be a community toilet and a community kitchen. Typical of the time was the Indian Head in Lincoln, New Hampshire. Still in existence today, it was opened by Ray Gordon in 1917 during the heyday of the auto camps. To draw the tourist in, he put up a 72-foot lookout tower. For 10 cents, you could get a spectacular view. By the late 1920s, as the auto camps were phasing out, the clusters of rentable shacks had grown into a giant business. Over the next four years, 400,000 cabins were built. How comfortable you'd be in those early days depended, of course, on what you paid. In the mid-1930s, for 50 cents, you could get a bed with toilet and electricity. But for a dollar, you could get a good bed, a full bathroom, a lamp, and chairs. And for two dollars, you had a real home. As cabin park owners expanded and upgraded, cabins soon became one continuous line of rooms, and the motel was born. The very first establishment to call itself a motel still stands today. 
It became the Motel Inn in its later years, but it was the Milestone Motel when it opened in 1925, about halfway between Los Angeles and San Francisco. Designed to look like the old Spanish mission in Santa Barbara, it was perfectly placed because no one wanted to make that long journey in a day. The plan, which never came to pass, was to build 18 motels from Seattle down to San Diego, just as in Spanish days when missions were within a day's horseback ride of each other. From the signs to the buildings themselves, Motel design became a world of fabulous confections, a world unto itself. The result was an astounding array of clever designs that added new character to the American road. What's important about motel design, not unlike gas station design for that matter, or any other roadside building, is what you can see from the road and who your customers are. In the case of motels, they were tired, over-the-line people who were generally in a place where they'd never been before and they were looking for any sort of reassurance or any kind of uh, quirky idea that would make them stop. Certainly one of the most unusual models for a motel was the Indian teepee. The owners, Frank and Vitra Redford, started the idea in the early 1930s. Frank predicted a teepee would bring tourists screeching to a halt. Starting with a teepee restaurant in 1931, he and Vitra eventually built what they named Wigwam Villages in the South, Southwest, and California. Typically, one large teepee would house the office and a restaurant. There would be a men's restroom teepee marked Braves and a women's marked Squaws, and then individual tourist teepees behind. They felt at home. It was a home away from home, and we treated them like family. We tried to fill their every need. If we didn't have it, we would go and get it. Frank Redford tried for authenticity, which got him into trouble in the early 1940s. One time, during uh, World War II, during Hitler's regime, he happened to take the Indian symbol that we had on the wigwams, and it was the swastika. And there were people from Ohio, Michigan, New York. They did not like that at all. And they, actually, we were threatened to burn, burn the place down. So he painted them out. <laughs> The modern motel may have started out a simple place, but bit by bit, the motel came to resemble its fancy downtown brother more and more. First to go in were offices and lobbies. In the beginning, there was no office, just the proprietor's own home. Later, little shacks were added, like the one at Ann's Motel in Vermont, that were definitely not designed for long chats. After World War II, owners began to build larger spaces that combined check-in and lobby areas. As he walks to the registration desk, our guest notices the friendliness of the desk clerk. The gate lodge is a separate building which houses a lobby for the convenience of all guests. Landscaped outdoor spaces were added. First patio areas and later swimming pools. Soon, every motel brochure featured an inviting pool on its cover. The reality was usually a heavily chlorined, often dirty pool, which was no one's idea of resort life. And only the kids jumped at the chance to splash in. But whatever else it offered, motels had to provide their guests with beds. That could mean a night of blissful slumber or eight hours of lumpy torture if you could climb aboard. I remember stopping along one of the motels and it was the first time I'd ever seen one of these called Magic Fingers, the, the, this bed that would sort of vibrate, you know, and I remember putting in a quarter and put the quarter in there and it starts vibrating. Oh, that's kind of interesting. And after about three minutes, 
I thought that's about enough and it didn't shut off I guess there's something wrong with it uh, and it, it just kept going and I and then I was trying to I was tired I want to go to sleep and this bed would just shake I finally got off it for a while sitting in a chair waiting for it to stop it wouldn't I just couldn't do it in fact I was trying to actually had to try to crawl and the bed was sort of like you couldn't move the bed so I couldn't even get the bed to move to pull the plug out so it must have taken me 35 minutes with this bed that just keeps vibrating Other amenities began to creep in with the passing years. Lighting to stub your toe by gave way to lighting you could actually dress by, and both the towels and the walls grew thicker. But whatever the changes in the motels, one basic need on the road didn't change, food. It didn't take motel owners and other entrepreneurs long to realize that sleepy Americans were hungry Americans, and a roadside restaurant could be very profitable. The roadside restaurant is a familiar, often well-worn sight on the landscape of the American road. But once, these eateries, with their promise of quick service and a hearty, if not always appetizing meal, were nothing less than revolutionary. Every bit as innovative in design as their roadside neighbor, the motel, restaurants also drew people in with the promise of comfort. I think there's something kind of fascinating about it, pulling into some place at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning and getting a, a cup of coffee, a, a piece of pie or whatever. Um, there's something on one hand lonely about it, on the other hand there's something very um, uh, kind of an odd sense of romanticism about it in a way. The era of the roadside restaurant began in the mid-1920s, just as the age of the auto camper was coming to an end. At first there were lunchrooms, simple but popular. And by 1927, the average customer was spending eight minutes on his diner stool and 25 cents during his stay. It was quick, as was the cook. Eventually, motels got into the act by offering full-service restaurants that brought in not only the overnight guest, but the day traveler, and even the locals. Opened in 1933, the Phillips Tourist Tavern, owned by Phillips Petroleum, carried the gas themes to extremes with unique offerings like special viscosity cream gravy and coffee via the pipeline. In the early 40s, Vitra Redford, owner of the Wigwam Village, quickly learned to accommodate her guests' gastronomic needs. We made uh, at least 10 to 12 pies a day, all kinds. And customers would sit and wait until that pie came out of the oven, if they saw you making it. That's how much they wanted it. They wanted the fresh, they didn't care if it ran all over the place. They wanted a fresh pie. For some customers, roadside food was more than just a break from traveling. As a young man, comedian Steve Allen was living a life that was anything but funny. He arrived in Del Rio, Texas one day, broke and desperate for something to eat. So he walked into the Bluebird Cafe. So I sat down at the counter and uh, looked through the menu and I ordered a hot roast beef sandwich with potatoes and gravy, mashed potatoes and gravy, and then I had uh, uh, some apple pie a la mode and about three cups of coffee, and that to me was just an appetizer. <laughs> the fellow said, will there be anything else, uh, expecting me to say no, give me a J, and I said, yeah, give me the whole thing all over again. So I ate the same meal twice, <laughs> and that did help a little bit with the hunger problem. And then I told them that I had no money which was not music to his ears. So I ended up spending three days in jail in Del Rio, Texas. One thing is for sure, there was nothing fat-free on the road. Nothing spelled L-I-T-E, and nothing was fancy. Uh, the epitome of roadside food would 
probably be a, a burger and fries. Biscuits and gravy with mashed potatoes. Barbecued hamburgers. Massive plates of hash browns and pancakes and eggs, sometimes all on the same plates. And ham and bacon and sausage with like three basted eggs with a lot of butter and toast. The baked potato and the salad bar. I would like a milkshake myself. The golden era of the diner in the 1950s coincided with America's post-war prosperity. After the rationing of the war years, Americans had a healthy appetite for the good life. The average person then consumed a record 74 pounds of beef each year. On the road, the choice was clear. Roadside food could be summed up in one word, and that's hamburgers. Um, that's a generalization, but pretty much uh, that's what was offered in most of these roadside joints. Uh, there were regional specialties. You could get lobster in uh, the northeast. You could get uh, chili and so on in the southwest. But hamburgers seemed to be the overall staple uh, that people expected when they came into a roadside restaurant. Roadside eateries got very good at hamburgers. There were patty molding machines that could mold, eject, and stack 1,800 patties an hour. And in 1956, White Castle could serve up 3,000 hamburgers an hour. Wimpy sold 75 million burgers from the early 30s to the early 50s. And Big Boy Burgers reached the 5 million mark in 1955. And to go along with them, 38,000 gallons of mayonnaise, 5 million bottles of ketchup, and 25,000 gallons of relish in one year. In both motel connected and standalone diners, there's always been some regional specialties, from cozy dogs in Illinois to Brunswick stew in the south to split pea soup in California. But only part of the story of roadside food was what was offered. If you couldn't get the fast-moving driver to notice your restaurant or motel or gas station, you'd starve. On-site advertising that could bring a speeding tourist to a halt, that was another big part of the roadside. The American road was in its heyday between the 1930s and 1950s. In 1935, 85% of all vacation travel was done by car. There was money to be made on these car passengers, and good old American enterprise seized the opportunity. But first, retailers had to get the motorists to stop at their store. Prior to the automobile, businesses had the luxury of having you walk up and look in their display windows, but now with the automobile you had to deal with people going by at 35 miles an hour, and that changed things dramatically. So what you had was businesses attracting people's attention with larger things, flashier things, uh, and so you had you know, large signs and you had buildings as signs, uh, and so that then changed the way that uh, the roadside attracted people. If it took the architectural equivalent of standing on one's head to get the motorist's attention, so be it. Signs came in every shape and size. Sometimes a whole building was a kind of sign that announced unmistakably what went on inside. The roadside itself was becoming a sideshow, an entertainment. Product advertisers were actually the first to realize the selling potential of roadside advertisements. One of the most successful sign campaigns was for a shaving cream called Burma Shave. Far as far start, from scratch. Careful where you throw that match. Burma Shave. The Burma Shave signs were so successful at selling a product that roadside businesses soon tried the gimmick. One of the most successful businesses to do this was a little drugstore in Wall, South Dakota. It would become a multi-million dollar business and one of the legends of roadside America, Wall Drug. Get a milkshake, get a root beer. Wall Drug store, pretty near. During the Depression, 
Ted Houston was a young pharmacist in Nebraska married to a South Dakota native, Dorothy Rush. With a little bit of money left by his father, Ted and Dorothy bought an old patent medicine store. After five years of barely breaking even, Dorothy Houston had a brainstorm. She went up and she said, Ted, why don't we put up some signs? Free ice water, wall drug. People were carrying their uh, ice in, uh, in canvas bags and the evaporation would kind of cool it, but it was still, uh, it wasn't ice cold. Ice water proved to be just the ticket to attract motorists driving along hot, dusty Route 16A. We take those 150-pound blocks of ice out and saw them up and grind them for the ice water. We'd fill their jug full of water and ice, and, and we became the ice water drugstore. Then the Houstons had an even better idea. Give wall drug signs away and let the customers do the advertising. Soon the signs started appearing all over the world. We uh, began to give away signs back in the 50s. And uh, they were a small met metal sign uh, Wall Drug of South Dakota, and we gave those away to the tune of 10,000 a year. Those signs went all over. Eventually, we advertised with the London uh, Transport Company, the Underground, and the Double Decker buses for over 40 years. From a small drugstore, Wall Drug eventually grew into a purveyor of just about everything, including amusements. Today, it's indescribable. A giant emporium with a Western theme that is part store, part museum, part restaurant, and even part chapel. And visitors can fill their prescriptions. Wall Drug is still the only pharmacy in a 6,000 square mile area. Or they can check out the wildest displays. There's even a cowboy orchestra. Three generations of Houston's have now been at the helm, and as many as 20 members of the family can be seen working here at any one time. As for the business, well, the family hosts up to 20,000 visitors a day and makes more than $11 million a year, and they're still serving ice water to their customers. Two thousand miles away from Wall Drug is another roadside business that beckons visitors through its flashy neon signs along the road from Pennsylvania to Florida. It's called South of the Border, the Carolina Border that is, and you can't miss it even if you try. The 104 foot, 77 ton neon statue of Pedro will see to that. You can visit the Sombrero Observation Tower play a round of golf at the, you guessed it, Golf of Mexico, or buy fireworks from the largest selection in the United States. Opened as a small beer stand in 1949, south of the border now attracts 100 million travelers a year. When families get into the car, it really is a sight. There is a great commotion when the kids begin to fight. Because when Dad says to them, we're going to take a ride, they all want the window on the ketchup bottle side. The need to be entertained has always loomed large for the squeezed-in occupants of an automobile. Driving long distances is tedious at best. And when some of the car's occupants are very small, very restless, and insist on knowing, are we there yet? 
Diversions of some kind can be lifesavers. We all stood around and looked up in the sky at the mighty ketchup bottle and we all exclaimed, oh my. The tower that we looked at was so mighty grand, the greatest ketchup bottle ever seen throughout the land. I guess the classic uh, family road trip uh, was depicted in, the, in a, a film I directed called National Lampoon's Vacation, Chevy Chase and Beverly D'Angelo, and they're crossing the country with a couple of kids on their way to Disney World. And I kept it uh, pretty much true to what I remember, which is kids squalling in the back seat. And, you know, I have two small sons right now, and they do the same thing, you know. Uh, I've even heard parents say that they've heard their kids yell, he's looking out my window. <laughs> There was plenty of tough competition vying for the kid in us all. And so that colorful, quirky phenomenon, the roadside attraction, came into being. Assuming that no one attracts more attention than Santa Claus, Santa's workshop opened in 1949. Its location in the town of North Pole, New York State, of course. This roadside attraction is one of the biggest collections of Santa memorabilia in the world. The houses at Santa's workshop were built by an ex-Walt Disney animator named Arno Monaco, who opened his own theme park in 1953, before the days of Disneyland. It's gone now, a victim of a series of destructive floods. But as Monaco's own home movie show, the land of make-believe was a paradise for kids. It drew up to 100,000 visitors a year, and it was a virtual city of miniature houses and storybook characters. The park may be gone, but many of the whimsical buildings were moved to other parks where there's still charming kids today. Here's another attraction which was guaranteed to draw a crowd, the Animal Park. Deep in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, there's a roadside attraction where bears are the thing. Opened in 1928, Clark's Trading Post includes a little steam railroad, an old gas station, a mystery house, and an old-fashioned Main Street. But the real stars of the show are the trained black bears. Welcome to Clark's Trading Post. The bears will try hard. They'll have a good time. Here is her favorite trick. We've used it since 1949, Bear in a Barrel. The patter is on the corny side, but that's half the fun. Eating ice cream. A little bit. Coming at you. Right across the ring, lickety split. On go, 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 move, move, move. There you ugly today. Woo. Scared him. In the beginning, the four legged attractions were not only black bears, but also Eskimo sled dogs. In 1958, we started giving rides on our newly built. White Mountain Central Railroad. The combination of the two was sufficient of an attraction to attract many people every summer. Four generations of Clarks have trained many generations of bears, but training the early bears, including a young one named Ebony, was quite a challenge for the novice trainers. At times, Ebony would run through the legs of the audience and right up into the main gift shop. And one of us right after her, and she'd wipe the goods right off the counters and onto the floor. And chaos uh, erupted when innocent people saw a little bear running among them. Murray Clark learned time and again that training bears could prove hazardous. 
In the earlier days, frequently I had my pockets of my pants torn out because that's where we always keep the little goodies that we pay them with as they perform. So our clothing was frequently torn and our forearms bleeding and uh, fingers hurting. Uh, many times they would get into squabbles among themselves right during a performance and uh, just put the ring into chaos. The public thought that was funny, but we who were trying to put on a performance didn't think it was funny. Today, Clark's is a true survivor. It's one of the very few roadside attractions that's little changed from its earlier days and is still thriving. Modern superhighways don't lend themselves to small, quirky mom-and-pop operations the way the old, slower roads once did. Still, if something sells, it'll never die. And many of the elements of the old places were just gathered up into bigger places, like Disney World. Yet some types of roadside fun will probably never again reach the popularity of days past. One of these, a craze that swept the nation, has a fascinating story all its own. Among the many attractions that grew up alongside the American road, the miniature golf course probably evokes more fond memories than anything else. The game got its start in the 1920s, a perfect time for a new craze. Prosperity was everywhere. The suffrage movement had helped women to feel at home outside the home. Prohibition closed the bars, and the general optimism in the air fostered all kinds of wacky fads. Miniature golf was among the biggest of them all. There was something very American about miniature golf because it's a game where a child can beat his parents at this game partially through luck and perhaps with a little bit of skill. It's you or I can be Arnie Palmer or Jack Nicklaus in a second. Uh, there's something very American about that. The real heroes of miniature golf were Garnet and Frida Carter. They were part owners of a resort on Lookout Mountain in Tennessee, and they built a course there in the mid-1920s that Frida designed. The purpose of the mini golf course was to amuse rich golfers who were waiting to play on the resort's full-size course. It became a hit, so in 1929, Garnet Carter patented his Tom Thumb course, and they were soon everywhere. It became what was known as the Madness of 1930, uh, and it spread like wildfire throughout the United States in 1930. There were thousands of miniature golf courses and people couldn't get enough of it. During this madness of 1930, an estimated four million Americans were out on a given night playing miniature golf on one of the 25,000 courses scattered across America. By the way, ever hear why it was called miniature golf? Well, you start, and in a minute, you're through. Plop. Many courses stayed open until 4 a.m., then reopened at 6 a.m. for early bird rounds. Each new course tried to outdo the last by being more clever, more colorful, more challenging. They have little constructions designed to increase the, the general cuteness and attraction of the whole operation little windmills and little castles and little dragon's dens and so forth. So uh, it, it's deli deliberately designed in, in a playful way. The, the architecture, such as it is, is uh, designed for children. And even though many of the people on a given day will be 47 years old, it's the child in them that is being appealed to uh, when they play such games. Miniature golf could be played on a date or as a family excursion. The best part was that it could be played by both rich and poor. The real game of golf was essentially for wealthy people at country clubs, and miniature golf became a democratization of the sport. 
so that everyday people could experience at least part of the allure and luster of the golfing mystique without belonging to country clubs and without having to pay a lot of money. The attraction to people of all ages and stages of life made miniature golf a huge competitor for the American amusement dollar. In fact, during the game's heyday, movie box office receipts plummeted as much as 25%. It got so crazy that some Hollywood studios even forbade their stars to appear in miniature golf courses. Though some, like silent screen star Mary Pickford, not only played, but built their own lavish links. And then, inevitably, there was a backlash. A large number of the estimated four million players like to putt until dawn, keeping those living nearby awake. As early as May of 1930, curfews and zoning laws were passed. Suddenly, the little links were on the defensive. Some tried to fight back. One California operator took advantage of a loophole that forced him to close at midnight by reopening 15 minutes later. The real enemy was inevitably fashion and economics. Americans were simply getting bored with the game, and there were too many competitors for all of them to survive. By late 1931, the short-lived craze began to fade. And that would have been that if the years after the Second World War had not opened up all those new suburbs where land was still cheap. Miniature golf's second great era began, but now it was a little different. The new courses were located mainly in the shopping strips that lined the roadside of suburbia. Many new courses used outlandish gimmicks. But for most kids, the game was still pure fun, usually. Probably my worst miniature golf experience uh, was I was, I think, at a, a course in Florida, and they had kind of a water hole. You had to hit the ball with some force to get it over uh, this, it seemed like a large amount of water compared to other miniature golf courses I'd been to. And it said no full swings, you know. There was a big sign, do not take a full swing, but I must have missed the sign. I took a really big swing with this golf club, and I was a little kid, and there was a kid standing too close behind me, <laughs> and I actually, bra you know, I brained this kid behind me, and of course his parents went and, you know, had a fit, and, <laughs> and I thought I'd killed him, you know, but uh, he, he was all right, but it was uh, a rough moment for me as a child. One innovator of the post-war game is Tommy Cole. In the 50s, he built fiberglass boats and thought the material would work better for the coarse obstacles than the concrete everybody else used. He built his first course in Florida in 1961. Instead of using miniatures for his characters, he made them exceptionally big. Tommy's name for his new course set the tone of the place, Wacky Golf. Ours was always a mixed theme, and uh, I guess that's the reason we thought the name was so good, uh, Wacky Golf. Um, we were looking for a name for this uh, operation when we first started, and one morning at breakfast, my daughter, who was nine years old at the time, said, Daddy, why don't you call it Wacky Golf? And that was the end of naming the golf courses. We've always used that name. Today, the miniature golf revival continues. And there's no better place to see it than in South Carolina, around Myrtle Beach, where one 50-mile stretch provides a living history lesson of this absolutely American pastime. After 75 years of fun, miniature golf is still the roadside at its best and most innocent. But at its height, just as America was having a good time on the Little Links, a darker, more dangerous side of the road began to appear. Even the FBI would take notice. It 
was the early 1930s. The nation was in the throes of the Depression. It was a desperate time for many, and a new element was using the roads for less than innocent pursuits. The car afforded the bad guys and girls quick transport to accessible escape routes. Soon the roads and the anonymous little cabins alongside the roads became an ideal spot to seek refuge from the law. Well, in the 1930s, motels started to get a reputation as being seedy, as being places for illicit activities, because of course you had your own little cabin, uh, sometimes a garage where you could hide your car. Unlike rooming houses and hotels, the tourist camps were usually located outside of town, often beyond the jurisdiction of local law enforcement. Travelers could arrive at night. There were no lobbies to walk through, and oftentimes no registers to check in. Into this unsupervised setting rode some of the most infamous criminals of the day, like Bonnie and Clyde. In the early 1930s, they would shoot it out with the police at the Red Crown cabins in Missouri. They survived, only to die in a hail of bullets by the side of the road in 1934. Here is Clyde Barrow and Bonnie Parker, who died as they lived, by the gun. Another storied villain, John Dillinger and his gang, often holed up in roadside camps, checking in under assumed names. More than once, they had to shoot their way out of a tough spot, as happened at the Little Bohemia cabins in Spider Lake, Wisconsin. Dillinger would escape and leave the cabin owners with an exciting tale to tell. Aside from hideouts, roadside motels and cabins were being used for other unsavory purposes. There were very, very short local vacations to be had that were an hour or two in length and the motel business set about to attract uh, these customers and criminals like to stay in motels as well. It took some earnest sociology students from Southern Methodist University to find out precisely what was going on. In 1935, they went undercover, so to speak, and checked into roadside cabins. They recorded license plate numbers to monitor who was coming and going and how often. They found that, for example, one cabin was turned over 16 times in one day. 102 out of 109 couples signed in with fictitious names. The students' conclusion about one such place? This tourist camp is no resting place for the weary but is an abode of love, a bower of bliss in which amorous couples devote themselves to the worship of Venus. It's no wonder that so many tourist cabins became known as hot sheet joints and no-tell motels. Into this landscape strode J. Edgar Hoover, chief G-man and crime fighter. The Federal Bureau of Investigation is waging and will continue to wage a relentless warfare against crime and criminals. In 1940, Hoover looked at the American roadside and didn't like what he saw. In an article in the American magazine, Hoover wrote, the majority of the 35,000 tourist camps threaten the peace and welfare of the communities upon which these camps have fastened themselves, and of all of us who form the motoring public. Many of them are not only hideouts and meeting places, but actual bases of operations from which gangs of desperados prey upon surrounding territories. Hoover 
Hoover described these tourist camps as a new home of disease, corruption, crookedness, rape, white slavery, thievery, and murder. According to him, the worst tourist camps were the ones with nightclubs attached. Here, all manner of crimes were rampant. Boys and girls, often from reputable families, Hoover wrote, go for a night of thrills. He went on to say these places were little more than camouflage brothels with prostitutes in the guise of entertainers, hostesses, or waitresses. Despite the fact that the vast majority of motels and cabins were clean, law-abiding places, the sleazy reputation stuck. And for the next three decades, the motel industry was tagged with a shoddy, trashy image that inspired all sorts of tales about the dark side of the road. Here we have a quiet little motel tucked away off the main highway. Well, the murderer, you see, crept in here very slowly across the showers on. There was no sound and uh, But however dangerous some motels and camps may have been, the fact is they were in the minority. While there are no-tell motels and hot sheet motels, there are also great, fabulous, wholesome motels as well. And the whole industry didn't deserve to be kneecapped because J. Edgar Hoover was uh, beating his drum. But by 1941, motels and tourist camps were battling more than a bad reputation. The outbreak of war brought a far greater threat than crime and sex could ever muster. Suddenly, millions of Americans were on the move, not by car, but by train, to get to embarkation points for overseas duty. With the war on, the American road suddenly became very quiet. The days of the pleasure trip were over as the message went out, save to win the war. The ration book became a part of everyday life and civilian spending plummeted from $61 billion in 1939 to just $38 billion in 1942. As for America's major car makers, General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler, they went into the full-time business of making tanks, aircraft, guns, and other weapons of war. But more than the absence of new cars, it was the severe rationing of rubber and gas that most affected the American roadside. Some car-crazy Americans tried anything to stay on course. In Sheep Hills, New Jersey, a man named Claude Haberstadt comes up with what he thinks will be the perfect answer, wooden tires. It should last a good many thousand miles. You can wear down two inches of wood, take out the bolts and place them two inches lower, wear down two more inches, and I hope the war is over by then. But for the most part, these were dire times. With the onset of World War II, everything ground to a halt. The roadside culture was just basically shut down for five years because of gasoline rationing and uh, the rationing of tires because so many of our men and some women were abroad because discretionary travel was uh, nearly impossible. Many motels and gas stations and roadside eateries just simply uh, shut down or scaled down for the duration. Motels, cafes, diners, gas stations, all the businesses of the road that had been built up since the 20s were in trouble. More diverse operations like Wall Drug were able to survive by scaling down and relying on local and not on tourist business. But the roadside attractions that focused solely on entertainment were the hardest hit. Just before America entered the war in 1941, 
Clark's Trading Post, home to those wonderful trained bears and sled dogs, had a record number of visitors, over 40,000. War changed all that. The following year, 1942, gas rationing uh, cut down tourism to only 20% of 1941 and we had to live on that 20% and care for our animals and so forth. That was a drastic cut down. It may have seemed during World War II that the glory days of the American road were gone forever. But in fact, once the war was over, America regained its optimism as millions of young men returned home looking for a new place to live and a chance to have some fun. The car culture was about to be reborn, and the American road was about to change once again, almost overnight. Good for a highway, good for the blues, good for a low path with nothing to lose you're running on empty you got holes in your shoes good for a highway good for the blues after world war ii had ended a new boom for the american roadside began more than 10 million gi's came home ready to have families and looking for a place to settle down away from the downtowns and farms where they'd been raised a promising future lay ahead. Americans wanted to get where they were going and get there fast in millions of new American cars. Good for a highway, good for the blues, good for a school kid breaking all the rules. With Main Street in the rear view mirror, the new frontier of the American middle class became the suburbs. There were shopping centers out on the edges of town, and these shopping centers began to draw all the business out of Main Street. People wanted to live in their own little houses on their own little plots of land, and so many, many housing developments were built. This created an influx of traffic that caused the creation of a whole new generation of roadside businesses beside these growing strips. <laughs> Between 1945 and 1954, 31 million babies were born, up nearly 30% from the 1930s. All those carloads of new parents and new children needed somewhere to shop and to eat and to amuse themselves. It didn't take long for roadside entrepreneurs to satisfy those needs. Baby, when the sun goes down, Say you crashed your daddy's car, well I guess I'll have to drive you. What the newly suburban masses seemed to crave most was entertainment. From the landscape emerged an amusement that had been little exploited up to then, the drive-in movie theater. It perfectly blended America's two greatest loves, cars and the movies. I'll pay our admission to park under the moon. Drive-in theater was the, the perfect melding of uh, all of Americans' interests. It could be in your car, you could be alone, uh, you got to see a movie, uh, you could eat while you were doing that. So it really answered all the things that Americans loved about their cars. The post-war era was the golden age of the drive-in movie theater. In 1941, only 50 screens existed, an average of just one per state. By 1958, 4,000 drive-ins lit up the night across the country. And as they rose from the empty lots from the farmland and fields of grain that were being lost to suburbia, they were called by all sorts of names. Under the Sky Emporiums, Autotoriums, Mudholes, 
and the nickname that needs no explanation, Passion Pits. Slowly but surely, drive-ins became much more than just movie theaters beneath the stars. Drive-in theaters uh, were in existence as early as 1934, but really hit their stride after the post-war period when uh, families really made the difference as far as their attendance. And rather than taking your family into a theater and getting dressed up, it was much easier to jump in the car, take the family and casually uh, enjoy a show uh, in your car. Uh, became very quickly, again after the war, um, part of what the roadside was all about. In record numbers, families packed their kids into the back seat for a night outside at the movies. Sprawled across an average of 15 acres, the largest drive-ins could hold up to 2,000 cars. Many a drive-in went to great and sometimes kooky lengths to attract and appeal to this emerging clientele. The backs of the huge movie screens were often adorned with elaborate murals that faced the side of the road and could be seen from afar. By the 1950s, owners had started promoting special amenities. This is where good old-fashioned American ingenuity really kicked in. Well, drive-in theaters offered every imaginable amenity. You could have your uh, baby bottle warmed. Uh, they would offer free diapers. You could drop off your laundry and have that done while you watched the movies. And of course, outside they offered all sorts of attractions. They would have swimming pools, miniature trains, uh, Ferris wheels and merry-go-rounds, horseshoe pits. So drive-ins really were the, the first complete uh, entertainment centers. And there were off-the-wall publicity stunts. One theater owner in Seattle, Washington, hired young girls to actually picket his movie theater. Their gripe? The family fun of drive-in movies was cutting into their babysitting business. Of course, it was all a ruse, but great publicity for the theater. But the best window of opportunity for bringing in revenue was just 10 minutes long, the intermission. During those few minutes, concession stands produced 70% of their business. Early drive-ins tried sending snack carts car to car, but the often unwanted intrusion turned off customers who needed privacy. Drive-in owners soon determined that a central concession was the way to go. To deal with the volumes of people, drive-ins pioneered cafeteria-style lines with a number of customer lanes and sections. They served up the staples as well as the exotic, including a rarity at the time, pizza. In fact, for many years, one of the only places to get a quick slice was the drive-in. At the concessions, you could feed the whole family. Of course, some people brought their own food. If a patron wanted to snap beans while she watched the movie, that was her choice. If you didn't get something to eat during the intermission at the drive-in movie theater, there was an alternative, the drive-in restaurant. Throughout the 1950s, a whole new wave of restaurants were popping up along the roadside to satisfy appetites for food served quickly. By 1964, there were 35,000 drive-in eateries across the country. Car Hops, the era's ubiquitous drive-in restaurant waitresses, developed their own little subculture. Waiting on eight to 12 cars at a time, the hops created their own unofficial tip rating system. Women, lousy tippers. Students, not much better. Middle-aged men, they meant hefty profits. But the best tippers of all, hands down, they were sailors. One drive-in required all hops to laugh at the customer's jokes. The penalty for not grinning? Folding a thousand napkins. Car hops had a tough job. But as the 50s progressed, so did other drive-in services. 
In 1955, a new wrinkle was added to the 50s drive-in craze, when a building management firm and a parking chain combined in Washington, D.C. to promote the drive-in office. No elevators and no people from ramp to roller decks in four and a half seconds. The perfect setup for the everyday workaholic. Some holy rollers found praying in their automobiles a divine experience. Throughout the decade, road worship took on many forms. In 1957, Jack Kerouac inspired a generation to find itself in the twists and turns of America's byways with his classic book, On the Road. And on the silver screen, the road was the destination. Riding their jalopies through the dust and route to Hollywood on bus. But as this decade came to a close, the coming of the faceless, interminable superhighway loomed. Rather than serving as destinations themselves, these roads would soon become, quite literally, throughways. But for now, the lure of the open road was still the stuff of dreams. American dreams. By 1956, America's roads represented the truest symbol of the nation's success. 65 million cars were on the roads, and it was time for the great era of highway building to begin. Preserve, protect, and defend. Under President Dwight Eisenhower, the Federal Highway Act of 1956 kicked off the construction of some 41,000 miles of interconnecting interstate highways. To build these interstates, workers dug up enough dirt to cover the entire state of Connecticut knee-high. Americans took instantly to the interstates. By 1960, they were driving 400 billion miles annually. In the old days, getting to your destination was half the fun. On the interstate, it was about getting to where you needed to go as fast as possible. That sensibility marked the beginning of the end for the mom and pops along the road. A lot of businesses relating to the interstate would form pockets on the off-ramps and chain restaurants would then uh, cater to these people off the interstate. But as far as coming into main roads and patronizing motels and local theaters and drive-ins and all of these highway uh, businesses, uh, they all took a second hand to the interstate travel. Uh, and that was kind of the death knell for the, the roadside. Roadside places were once destinations in themselves. In the age of the interstate, drivers bypassed the old roads and old haunts. They now stopped at establishments that were familiar and reliable. The large franchised and corporate chains that grew up beside the interstate offered a predictability of facilities, a standardized, pretty good quality kind of experience, but not an individualized one. A home builder from Memphis, Tennessee, a man named Kemmons Wilson, would be one of the first to fill this need for reliability and revolutionize the look of the roadside. His epiphany began in 1951, when he packed the wife and kids into the car and headed north to Washington, D.C. for a vacation. By then, variety in roadside lodging was no novelty, and many of the motels and cabins were either past their prime or were shoddy to begin with. Appalled by his overnight stops, Wilson described the trip as the worst vacation of his life. He measured each room and set about to come up with an alternative. One of his employees, a draftsman, drew up plans for a one-story motel. He had seen the Bing Crosby and Fred Astaire film Holiday Inn the night before, and that's what he labeled the plans. Kevin's Wilson liked the plans and loved the name. The Holiday Inn was launched. In 1952, the prototype opened in Memphis. It was strategically placed at the entrance to the city. 
The sign that was to become famous told anybody within a half a mile that there was a Holiday Inn here. He offered the traveling public a gift shop, a pool, a restaurant with good food and free lodging for the kids. Once inside, travelers were greeted by bigger standardized rooms decorated in chartreuse and white. Compliments of another designer, Kemen's own mother, Ruby Dahl Wilson. People loved it. By 1954, the business was a franchise operation, with each Holiday Inn owner paying Wilson's company an initial fee of $500 plus a nickel a night per room. By 1968, there were a thousand Holiday Inns, with a new inn opening every three days and a new room going up every 20 minutes. By 1970, this chain had become the first food service and lodging company to ever earn a billion dollars. By the mid-1990s, there were over 2,000 worldwide. Fast food also became a staple for drivers on the go who didn't have time to search for mom's or pop's delicious homemade fixings. As a result, another franchise would prove more successful than perhaps any other in history. You, you're the one. Your egg muffins waiting. Two all beef patty special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. Two all beef patty special sauce, lettuce, cheese, onions, pick pickles, onions on a lettuce. It's a good all beef patty special sauce. Thanks to the hamburger, a milkshake mixer salesman, Ray Kroc, would become a roadside legend. In 1954, he bought out Dick and Mac McDonald's hamburger stands, and by 1962, this burgeoning roadside chain sold hamburger number 700 million. Today, Downey, California is home to the oldest original Golden Arches, part of a worldwide business with annual sales of more than $25 billion. The 1950s launched dozens of these franchise success stories, like Stuckey's, Best Western, and the Ramada Inn. Another was the Howard Johnson chain. On the road around the corner, here's the place to go. The orange root of Howard Johnson's, join the folks who know. Good food, good fun, kids count too. 28 flavors just for you at Howard Johnson's. Next stop. At the same time the franchises were scooping up all the roadside business, the mom and pops were shutting their doors. But in San Luis Obispo, California, there's a motel that stands as a kind of national treasure. One of the few roadside establishments that was just too special to ever close, the Madonna Inn. Welcome to Madonna Inn. The Madonna Inn offers travelers the very opposite of what Holiday Inn has to offer, and Holiday Inn has to offer a standardized conventional motel room. At the Madonna Inn, Alex and Phyllis Madonna have 109 motel rooms, and every single one of them is completely different. In 1958, Alex Madonna and his wife Phyllis went into the motel business. 
They had their own design ideas. We had a very difficult time trying to choose one thing, so we decided to, to do a little bit of everything and uh, feeling that maybe we'll make more people happy because not all of us have the same taste. And Alex has an old expression of, uh, what is it that you say when you're asked that question? If you have every room different, you can't make the same mistake twice. Up in the attic is the Cloud Nine room. A suspended angel blesses and protects the lucky inhabitants. In the Irish Hills room, babbling brooks, shamrocks, and leprechauns help you sleep better at night. Want to have a rendezvous with a loved one? There are three appropriate rooms to choose from. Ron, Day, and Wu. And for something really different, the waterfall urinal. But the most sought after place to sleep is the caveman room, with enough bedrock to make Fred Flintstone feel at home. We've had Doris Day, Peggy Lee, uh, Frank Sinatra, George Burns. I just can't think of all of them, but we've had them all at one time or another. Kim Novak and uh, uh, I think everyone but Madonna, <laughs> which is okay. <laughs> Perhaps there's still hope for those with individual tastes. Well, I think there's been a uh, renewed interest in roadside businesses in recent years because uh, we can always go to a chain restaurant even right near home but uh, the old roadside places offer a, a glimpse of not only a different era but a different way of living uh, uh, where your meal is cooked right there for you instead of arriving frozen daily and uh, where every motel you stay at is a little bit different it's not the exact same experience no matter where you're at. The nostalgic yearning for the open road, for the unexpected experience awaiting just around a bend, is still alive on the road that cuts through America, Route 66. Once again, over 20,000 vehicles a year travel the Mother Road long after its heyday of the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Roadside motor court, cabins made of sandstone. Traveling in style was a port in the storm. Over 4,000 members belong to Route 66 associations worldwide. They're looking for a part of America they've only heard about. And all of a sudden, what was old is new again. Route 66 is attracting people from all over the world. And uh, it's really been a boon to those places that had sat dormant for a quarter century. Even some of the big corporations have gotten a message. From the 1920s through the 1960s, gas stations prided themselves on service, clean restrooms, and free maps. Then they became stripped down operations, offering little more than self-service gas pumps. Now, some are trying to win back customers with smiling service attendants and sparkling restrooms. Of course, however wide the smile, they will never take the place of family businesses. We've lost the romance of travel. When you could stop at mom and pop, you could visit with them. You knew who you were talking to, and you remembered them. Sometimes you became friends. And you would go back there again on your next trip, and they would still be there. You don't do that today. You don't know anybody. You've lost that. But what we haven't lost is the legacy of those moms and pops who guided us on our roadside adventures, who figured out ways to put gas in our cars, food in our bellies, and pillows beneath our heads. They're the ones who dreamed up the highway hangouts that are so much a part of our roadside memories. Whatever has been lost of the great American roadside may never be fully recaptured. But one thing is certain, 
In America, the road will always symbolize adventure, freedom, something wild, something real. In 1966, executives from all the big oil companies were summoned to the White House for a top-level meeting. Lady Bird Johnson complained about their gas stations, which she considered ugly and a blight on the American landscape. But there was at least one service station that met with her approval, a Phillips 66 outlet in Cloquet, Minnesota. It was designed in 1958 by famed architect Frank Lloyd Wright who felt its copper roof, skylights, and luxurious customer lounge would lead to a new era in gas station design. Of course, Wright's new era never arrived, but his gas station is still in business, still pumping Phillips 66 at the intersection of highways 33 and 45 in northern Minnesota. In addition to fuel and oil, it's probably the only place in the world where you can get a guided tour of a gas station. For the History Channel, I'm Roger Mudd. Thanks for watching. Good for a highway, good for the blues, good for a low pass with nothing to lose. You're running on empty, you got holes in your shoes. Good for a highway, good for the blues. Blue.